so Freddie Villano here from Base Gear Magazine with Chris Childs from Thunder. And um, I mean, just to kick things off right away, I, one of the things that uh, really always pops out to me because I'm a bass player myself um, is good tone. And I really appreciate your tone on the record. Um, it's got a lot of clarity and character, which is important to me. Um, and I'm wondering, well, I'll, I'll start out with um, the song that I wanted to mention first, which is the last song on the record. If my computer will co cooperate with me here. Um, just bear with me one second. I should be able to tell you that really, shouldn't I? But <laughs> I actually can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to have it in one second. Here we go. No smoke without a fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is really centered around that bass motif, uh, the chord double stop figure that you yeah. play. Um, and I'm wondering if you can shed a little light on how that part came about or, I mean, did that, it sounds to me like that song was crafted around that bass part, but I don't know, maybe that came later. Well, no, basically Luke, uh, the guitarist, Luke Morley, is, is also the, the main songwriter. Mm -hmm. And he, he demos the, uh, the tracks. And when we get to hear them, they're basically fully formed. Everything is on them. He, he programs the drums. He's, right. a, he's actually a great bass player. I, I hate to admit it, <laughs> um, but he's, he is, he's a really, Darn really those good guitar player. players. <laughs> I know, damn them. Um, but he, he came up with all the parts. So, so basically most of the time when we go into the studio, I'm just playing what he's already written. Obviously, okay. if I, if I, if I have ideas, he's always quite open-minded to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and he'll have a listen and, and we'll work on it. And if it's better than what he's got, then we'll use it. But with that particular part, and maybe that's, maybe that's how the song started, you know, when he was yeah. just fiddling around with the bass and it's kind of how it came up. What's your uh, signal chain like in the studio for this record? Did you go in and just dial in one sound for the whole record or do you tweak it from song to song? What's your approach there? Uh, well, we did it. We did it over a couple of studios. Um, we we recorded at Rockfield, which is our, our normal sure. uh, normal place, mm -hmm. and we also used a place called Vader. So um, the 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 equipment from my end was the same. I actually used the Status um, on on this on this album. Uh, I had a Status years and years ago. I had one of the series, a very very early series two. Uh, five string headless um which i unfortunately had to sell and like you know every bass you sell you wish you hadn't yeah, yeah. but um uh, uh, like a couple of years back i decided i was going to get myself another one and it is just it's just phenomenal because i i'm i'm a sandberg end or c so sandberg basses are great but for this particular album this the state has just worked better for it it's got a very very aggressive sound Mm -hmm. um so i use the status um i use a, a baseman 800 head which is the uh the one with the the valve pre and the, the solid state power or the class d power amp um and a, a 410 neo cab and a 115 neo cab mm -hmm. which are um mic'd individually i'm not sure what mics i use they've got a whole stock of like these amazing vintage mics yeah. i know it went through a, a neve um, mic preamp um so we had we actually had five tracks of bass if i recall we had a di okay. um um uh, two two mics i think two separate mics and then we also had a distortion channel i think i'm i, I i'm not entirely sure what we used i think it might have been my very very old um big muff Sovtech um yeah. pedal just yeah. grinding it out there so we got that to 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 put in if we needed to um and uh and uh, mike fraser he he obviously used uh, the 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 uh, the perfect combination of of the of all of these tracks because i absolutely love the sound he's got on the album yeah it's 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 great uh you know it's interesting uh i don't know i think it's become more uh, of an accepted approach um in recent years but i i think fo a lot of folks generally don't realize how effective distortion can be on bass, uh, particularly in the studio, when you're in a rock band, it really kind of helps that top end cut through the mix Absolutely. Um, in a way that um, you wouldn't get otherwise. 
yeah definitely it's it's um i I'm, I'm not used a great deal of it in the past but i'm mm. i must admit i'm more more and more i'm beginning to on on the uh on the recent tour we just did i uh i took i because so i've got you know as i'm sure every bass player have got i've got drawers and drawers full of pedals that <laughs> yeah. i bought and thought great at the time this is the best thing ever and then just put it away and never used it again <laughs> but i dug out um my sansamp bass driver Mm. um and and just got a little bit of crunch from that and, and it does like you say it makes a huge difference yeah are you using the same rig live that you use in the studio the basement or... I, uh i the the heads are the same i use a, an 810 neo cab yeah okay uh, live yeah because um, i've to, to be honest i've always striven for the the chris squire sound Okay. You know, I've, I I bought a Rickenbacker because because I wanted to sound like Chris Squire, and of course, I didn't. <laughs> but, but I did I did find out just recently. I found out why it's the Rico sound, isn't it? Yeah. That's what it's all about. Um, unfortunately, I, I need to play a five string on on your know, on the Thunder songs because a lot of them have dropped D now, mm -hmm. and uh, of course you can't use a wireless with a Rico sound because it needs a stereo lead. So right. Uh, the first world problems, I think they call those. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the um, you're saying you do it a lot of drop D. Um, is there a reason why you chose the five string over just detuning an E string on a four string? Because on a five string, you've got to fret that D, right? Yeah. Versus, um, I've I, I've been playing five string for for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, i just find it slightly restrictive to to go back to the to the four yeah. it's it's interesting because when luke writes the songs he doesn't play five strings so he <laughs> he, he he does drop the d mm. and of course he's right in the bass line with the with the open d so sometimes playing it on a five string is actually quite difficult you know to, uh, yeah. To, to try and keep it nice and clean whereas where, where you, when you've got an open d and uh, a drop d it's a lot easier on some songs but yeah. you know again it's just something that it's uh, it's it's a it's a trade-off between having you know changing bases over mid set and and just using the same because i only ever use one bass uh, live yeah, I found in my, for myself what I like about a five string is that um, I can often play stuff in one position rather than moving up and down the neck. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I did when when we when when we first started doing um, songs in thunder with a, with a drop D. I, I fitted my uh, my bases with D tuners, which work extremely well. Yeah. But you know, when, once I got to the five, it was kind of no going back. Yeah. If they were hip shot detuners, um, they're located not far from where I live. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yes, they in, were. In central New York, here in central New York. Yeah, they work great. <laughs> I've used them a lot. Um, you mentioned Chris Squire. Do you play with a pick as well or a finger style? Uh, both. Yeah. Wh whichever, whichever the song requires. Um, with with thunder, uh, unless it's a ballad, it's it's always a pick. Yeah. Because it just it just gives it. Uh, uh, and I find. If I'm playing with a pick, I'm just slightly more on top of the beat. Mm. You know, if I'm playing fingers, I'm just slightly behind it. So yeah, it, it gives it, it gives it a push and aggression. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction because a lot of people talk about the nuances between pick and fingers as being, you know, a harder attack or a softer attack. But I like that you um, have noticed this other sort of aspect of it where you know because i i would probably agree with that sentiment that the pick drives tends to yeah you know be lend itself to being more on top of the beat and the fingers probably lend itself to being more behind the beat if i think yeah. about my own playing in that regard yeah who are some How of your you? what's that are you you fingers or pick or both i do both yeah i i, I do both i uh, you know, I'm, when I was younger, I played mostly with my fingers, but yeah. <clears throat> as I got older and learned that people like John Paul Jones and, and whomever else played both, yeah. um, I found that, you know, it was just cool to have another sound available to me. Um, and, and certainly playing rock and roll with distorted guitars, the pick tends to cut through that a bit more cleanly absolutely um, so um so i i you know 
I, I can't say I play as fluidly with a pick as I do with my fingers, but it just, it does make me play more, um, more thoughtfully, I will say, because I can't mm. do the things with a pick that I can do with my fingers. So, um, you know, I have to kind of play it. Same with a five string. I have to think more with a five string than I do with a four string. It doesn't come as natural. Yeah. Um, so I kind of have to plot out the song for the most part. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about choosing the right tool for the job, isn't it? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, nothing nothing is going to work for everything. So if it's, it's having as many different things in your armory as possible, isn't it? Just being able to say, okay, that's what I need for that song. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, whether it's an amp or a, a sound or a pick or a guitar or, or a string even, you know, sometimes yeah. strings. I have bases that have lighter gauge strings on them just because they work better than other bases, you know? And yeah, so, yeah. Um, but uh, who, when, so when you were starting out, like what, who were some of your early influences aside from Chris, Chris Squire? Um, when, I, when I first started out, I guess, because um, I started off playing the guitar. Okay. Uh, and and obviously I listened to Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple. R Richie Blackmore has always always been my favourite guitarist and always mm. will be. I think. Um, so John Paul Jones uh, was was a, a big favourite of mine. But then as I started getting into bass, I listened to Louis Johnson because I'm I, I I was never really a rock bass player. You see, yeah. <laughs> I was more of a funk player. You know, it's yeah. Louis Johnson, Jacko. Um, I was the, the strange thing is I was never a fan of John Entwistle. Uh -huh. Never, I, I big, especially when I was when I was learning and learning all the tech stuff and and all the you know all the technique. I thought, well, you know, John's messy. He just makes a noise. <laughs> but then, when when if you if you ever play a Who song and you start taking it to pieces and realize the importance of what he does, that guy is an absolutely brilliant bass player. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned his name. Well, there, there's two things uh, I want to bring up about Lewis Johnson, but we'll get back to that. John, uh, John Entwistle. Yeah, the Who is an interesting band because I feel like Pete Townsend is, is the rhythm instrument in that band and the drums and the bass are the lead instruments. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so like if you think about John Entwistle in that context, you know, everything he does is unorthodox from a bass player perspective, like what you're supposed to do in a band. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to, uh, I remember a few years ago, there was a list of the five greatest bass players, you know, and all of these lists are subjective and whatnot, but the guy who made this list excluded John Entwistle because he said, it's a given that he's number one, you know, so let's just take him off the list. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, just, and mostly citing, the uniqueness of his approach, you know, how, how different it was than any, anybody else. That's, um, that's absolutely right. It's, yeah. it's very, very hard to play like John Entwistle. It, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can play the notes, you can play the parts, but to play him the way that he did is very, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Lewis Johnson. I see a music man behind. It looks like a music man. Is that a music man behind? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, it's a Sterling actually. Okay, cool. And it, and because I, w I was toying with the idea of I, I always want I, I had I have a Music Man Stingray uh, four string fretless. Mm -hmm. I used to have a four string fretted, which I, I got rid of a while back. Um, and I and I always wanted one of the original, uh, like Louis Johnson, you know, the maple finish. Um, uh, and but I wanted a five, and and the 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 one that they bought out, which because I don't like the 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 scratch plate on their on their normal their standard five string. Mm -hmm. I, did, I I I prefer like you know the the rounded one. Yeah. And and they did bring out like a reissue type five string, but it was two and a half thousand quid, and I thought, my God, you know, it's a it's a lot of money. Uh, for a bass that I'm probably going to put on the wall. Um, and and I saw this one for for six hundred quid. I got it just to, you know, I basically ordered it without without trying it. And it's phenomenal. I absolutely love it. It 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 sounds like a music man and it plays beautifully, you know, for and for that price, you you can't go wrong really. Yeah. Yeah, they they make a good product. <clears throat> they, they do. I always wanted a um <clears throat> one of my bucket list bases is a saber, the two pickup oh, one. All right. Yeah. Um but uh the so uh do you are you so the you since you don't write 
are, are there any, um, what, what's your, like, when you're off tour or, or not in the recording studio, do you have a, a regimen that you keep up with practice wise, or is it just revolve around pr preparation for, you know, working live? Um, no, no, I, like I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say I've, I have any, I have any kind of regimen. Um, I basically, I'll just pick that up. You know, when, when I, when I feel like playing, I'll just pick it up and play and, and, yeah. and enjoy it, you know? Um, but I, I do a lot of other stuff. Uh, I, I've got a, a studio here where I, I'm, I actually mixed, um, seven of the tracks on the new album. Oh, wow. uh, Mike, Mike Fraser, Mike Fraser did the majority of them. I did like the less important tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, only four of them actually made it onto the album, but I was really pleased, you know, the, the yeah. fact that I was, I was kind of up against Mike, which was, you know, it's a big deal. <laughs> Um, but I also do a lot of graphic design. I, I design all the T-shirts and uh, uh, do a lot of the videos, like the promo videos. Oh, cool. um, so I, you know, I just I kind of keep myself busy as as well as playing bass. Yeah. And and also I've I've done a few albums remotely from here as well. Mm -hmm. I did one. Um, uh, was it last year or the year before? I kind of lose track over these strange couple of years with yeah, uh, with yeah. Simon Kirk on drums, which was uh, wow, uh, which was absolutely brilliant. You know, he's he's always been one of my favourites from from way way back, and and to work with Simon was was an absolute honour. We did we did one album in the studio, um, so I actually got to play with him. Then the second album was done during lockdown, so he did his stuff in in New York or wherever. And I did my stuff over here, which wasn't as much fun. And especially <laughs> yeah. the way Simon plays, you know, you need to be in a room with him because he's got that push and pull and flow and, and it does, just doesn't work remotely. But we got the album finished and it sounds great. Who's the, who's the album with, can you say, or is it? Yeah, it's um, just so happens I've got a copy here. It's a, it's a project called Lone Rider. Okay, cool. Uh, it's... Uh, Singer called um, Steve Overland, who's uh -huh. the singer for FM. Yeah, Guitarist sure. called Steve Morris, who played for Gillen and various other people. Myself uh -huh. and and Simon. Well, and uh, yeah, we, we we've done two albums. That's that's just been released, I believe. Yeah, that must have been a real joy. I mean, Simon um, has played with two of my favorite bass players, Boz Burrell and Andy Frazier. And so I, you know, I appreciate the amount of um, space he leaves in a song it gives the yeah. bass some some room to breathe and and be musical um yeah those know. those two guys are, are, were a massive influence on my playing yeah absolutely uh, you, you you have you only have to listen to the stuff i do well not necessarily with thunder but but on other projects you you'll hear you'll hear them all over it yeah yeah i'm gonna have to check that out what's your uh what's your recording pl platform are you using pro tools or logic or uh, well, I'm using Pro Tools and Cubase. Um, okay. I, I used Cubase for years and years and years, but then, you know, Pro Tools is the standard, and, and especially for for like mixing the uh, the albums, it's so easy if somebody sends you a, a Pro Tools project file, so you can just open it up and and you're away then. Yeah, yeah, cool. Why do you? I I always, <laughs> it's funny, you know. I know a lot of bass players who end up mixing stuff. Why do you think bass players make good mixing engineers? <laughs> I mean, I have my reasons. Um, I uh, I've never really thought about it, to be honest. But you're you're absolutely right. Um, I maybe it's bass players have more of an overview. They yeah. they tend to sit back and listen and listen to everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. I don't know. That way, I mean, that's certainly how how I work. You know, yeah. I'm. I'm con like playing live. I'm I'm constantly listening to everything that's going on. Yeah, that's my theory. I mean, my theory is that like our, our bass player's primary function is to make everybody else sound good first, you know, b before putting the spotlight on yourself. So um, that's absolutely right. It's like that overview provide lends itself to being a good <clears throat> mixing engineer. Ultimately, yeah. it seems like anyway. It's sort of a broad statement, but. Um, well, there's there are a few of them, you know, um, Roger Glover and and yeah, um, yeah. Steve, uh, Steve, what's his name from Iron Maiden? You know, to, yeah, to name Harris. a couple. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep, yep. 
So what's next for Thunder? You guys got to hit the road in support of this record? Is that uh, on the agenda? Well, we've <clears throat> we've just finished a, a UK arena tour, okay, which well. went extremely well. Um, that was great. We've we just did a festival in Sweden, um, and then we've got another four coming up over the next couple of weeks. Um, one in uh, Denmark, one in Belgium, one in switzerland and one in france but all mm -hmm. big really good festivals and um, from then there's nothing else for the rest of the year luke will go back to writing um then we'll probably start on another album early next year so it's it's kind of it's 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 not going to stop you know there we've we've had a couple of hiatuses in the past mm -hmm. uh where we decided for one reason or another we should just stop and do something else but i don't see that happening again now i think i think it's full steam ahead until we all fall over yeah yeah has um it, has Bre brexit complicated how you tour europe at all has it made that process more uh, challenging i don't want to say difficult that's that's an understatement. It's basically, <laughs> it means it's not possible for Thunder to tour in Europe anymore. Well, because, because it, um, financially, it was always close to the wire. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we would tour in order to promote albums, you know, to try and raise a profile, to, to, to do whatever we could to, to expand the audience. So, um, and there was never a great deal of profit from it. And now, because it's all so difficult, it's, yeah. it's, it just makes it. I mean, even it, when we flew out to Sweden, we had to have a carne for the, uh, for the guitars that we took on the plane, which is, which is just ridiculous. You know, we never had that before. Right. And that's just one flight. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hopeless, really. Yeah. We're living in strange times, for sure. We uh, really are. Here in the States as well. <laughs> so, um, Cool, man. Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. I'm, again, I really appreciate the album and your playing and your tone and um, really it um, spoke to me on a way that really appeals to me as a, as a bass player. I'm oh, thank you very much, Frank. tend to gravitate towards players such as yourself and all the you know, pyrotechnics and stuff like that. I, I like guys that, yeah play bass you know I yeah mean, like, yeah like, exactly yeah. everybody's got a role in the band yeah and when everybody sticks to it that's when it works really well yeah all right chris well it's lovely to see you and yeah, uh, you too. hopefully one day one day thunder will be over in america sh doing shows and maybe we can hook up who knows yeah that would be great if not i'm gonna try to get to the uk of all the places i've been to in europe i've never been to the uk Oh, well, then you must come. You must come and we'll meet up, mate. Yeah. That's a right. promise. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Thanks again, mate. See you soon. Bye-bye.